Welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, I wanted to share with you a quick but very simple and powerful tip whenever you're looking at M&A deals and if you are ever asked about how equity value and enterprise value change before and after acquisitions take place. A very common question in interviews is something like the following. Company A acquires Company B using 100% debt what is the combined company's enterprise value? Or what is the combined company's equity value? Or they could say something like company A acquires company B using 100% stock. What is the combined enterprise value to EBITDA multiple? And the truth is these questions may seem complicated, but there are actually a few very simple rules you can use to calculate all of these. Now, before we get into those rules, just to review a little bit, with enterprise value, it is the value of a company's core business operations to all the investors in the company. That's the real definition and meaning of it. So what this means is that when you start with equity value and you want to calculate enterprise value, you add anything that represents other investors in the company. So debt, preferred stock investors, any other items like that, convertible bonds that count as debt, anything that represents other investors in the company, you need to add when calculating this. But then you also need to subtract anything that represents a non-core asset, such as cash or investments, because we're only concerned with the core business operations and the assets and liabilities that correspond to those. And then we also want to represent all investors in the company. Now, the so what of this, the reason why enterprise value matters is that regardless of how a company funds its operations with debt, with equity, with preferred stock, enterprise value is not going to change. We saw in an earlier video how with Coca-Cola, they could issue $10,000 worth of shares or they could raise 10000 in debt. And regardless of how it finances itself, its enterprise value and its enterprise value-based multiples are not going to change. And the same goes for if it repurchases shares or if it repays debt. So that is why enterprise value is so important. And here are the rules you can use in M&A deals when you're looking at the same concept. The combined equity value is just the acquirer's equity value plus the value of stock it issues to buy the seller. So in an M&A deal where over 50% of the other company is acquired, its equity value goes away, its shareholder's equity goes away completely, and all that's left is the acquirer's equity value. If it issues stock, then you also have to add that. The combined enterprise value, though, is equal to the acquirer's enterprise value plus the seller's enterprise value. So this is actually easier to calculate because if you know both companies' enterprise values already, it's just a simple addition after the acquisition. And then with a few of the most common multiples, such as EBITDA and PE, the combined enterprise value to EBITDA multiple is just calculated by taking both companies' enterprise values because we know what the combined enterprise value is. You just add up each company's enterprise value separately, and then you add their EBITDAs separately, and it's just a simple division. So this is not impacted at all by the purchase method, cash, stock, or debt, or any combination of them. Regardless of how the buyer acquires the seller, this will stay the same. And then the combined PE multiple, for this one, there isn't really a shortcut. This one is actually impacted by the mix of cash, stock, and debt. So you actually need to calculate now. But at least the first three rules here can be very useful and time-saving. Let's look at an example in Excel now. So here we have company A with an enterprise value of 100, equity value of 80, and company B with an enterprise value and equity value of 40. And then we have their EBITDA and net incomes. We have company A's tax rate, and then we have the EBITDA and net income for company B. So to start with, let's calculate their multiples separately. So the enterprise value to EBITDA multiple for company A, and then the PE multiple. So we'll take equity value and divide by net income to get that. And then we can copy and paste and get the same multiples for company B over here. So you can see that before the transaction, we have an EBITDA multiple of 10X and a PE multiple of 20X for company A. And then for company B, we have an EBITDA multiple of 5x and a PE multiple of 20x. So the EBITDA multiples are quite different, but the PE multiples are the same. 
So what happens when a deal takes place? What happens when company A acquires company B to equity value, enterprise value, and the multiples? Well, first you need to think about the price that's being paid for company B. And in this case, we're gonna assume that they're just acquired at their current equity value, which is probably not gonna be true in real life, but we're just using it as a simplifying assumption here. So we'll say 40 million for the price paid for company B. And then the combined enterprise value per the rules that I just gave you, the combined enterprise value is just company A's enterprise value plus company B's enterprise value. The combined equity value is just gonna be company A's equity value. Remember, company B's equity value is completely written off when they get acquired, it goes away. All that's left is company A's equity value. And then if stock is used to fund the deal, then you have to add the value of stock there as well. So we'll take the purchase price for company B, 40 million, multiply by the percent of stock used, and that'll be our combined equity value. Just to test this out, if we change debt to 80% and stock is now 20%, you can see our combined equity value has gone up to 88 million. So it's now greater than company A's equity value as a standalone entity. Now for the combined EBITDA, we can just take our two companies' EBITDAs over here and add them together. We can do this because this is before interest, it's before depreciation and amortization, it's before taxes, and so it's not going to be impacted by the interest on debt, the foregone interest on cash, or anything else like that. And then for the combined net income, we can take company A's net income, and we can take company B's net income, and we'll assume they have the same tax rate. Again, a bit of a simplification, not always going to be true in real life, but it helps us here. And then we need to factor in the fact that if debt or cash are used, there's going to be interest associated with those. So with debt, let's take the price paid for company B and multiply by the percent debt, and then multiply by the interest rate on debt, and then multiply by one minus the tax rate because the interest paid on debt is tax deductible. So we'll multiply by the one minus 25%. And then we'll do the same thing for the foregone interest on cash. So price paid for company B, times the percent cash, times the foregone interest rate on cash, times one minus the tax rate up there. So we have the combined net income, and then let's get our combined enterprise value to EBITDA multiple and our combined PE multiple. So we'll take our enterprise value, divide by our combined EBITDA, and we'll take our equity value and divide by our combined net income. And so you can see that. Now, to illustrate what happens here, and to show you more of the key point behind this concept, let's try changing the mix of cash, debt, and stock here. So what happens if I make this one-third cash, one-third debt, and one-third stock? And remember, right now, we have an EV to EBITDA multiple of 7.8x and a PE multiple of 26.7x. So let's just change this and see what happens. And look at this, our combined enterprise value has stayed the same, our combined EBITDA has stayed the same, our combined EBITDA multiple has stayed the same, but everything that's equity value based has now changed because now we are issuing stock, now we have interest on debt and foregone interest on cash, and so on and so forth. And you can play around with this if you want, you can try all sorts of other possibilities here and simply see what happens. And you'll see that the enterprise value to EBITDA multiple, EBITDA, and the combined enterprise value always stay the same. So to just do a quick recap here, you're always gonna wipe out the acquired company's equity value and shareholders equity in an M&A deal. If it's a 100% cash or debt deal, the combined equity value is just the equity value of the acquirer. But if stock is being used, they have to add the value of that stock. The combined enterprise value is just the acquirer's enterprise value plus the seller's enterprise value. And so regardless of how you fund the deal, the combined enterprise value is just the seller plus the buyer, and it does not change at all depending on the mix of cash, stock, and debt. And similarly, the combined enterprise value to EBITDA multiple also doesn't change regardless of the mix of cash, stock, and debt. So what's the problem with this rule? In real life, it often does not hold up that well. It's very much the type of rule you can use for interview questions or assessment centers or case studies, but it doesn't really hold up in real life in a lot of cases. 
The first reason is that usually a premium is paid for the seller. So usually if the seller's market cap is 50 million, they can't be acquired for 50 million. They want 60 or 70 or 75 million or some amount that's greater than what they're currently worth on the open market. So to get around this, you can just use the seller's enterprise value at the share price premium instead and use that 60 or 70 or 75 million and run the numbers the same way. Another reason why it often doesn't hold up is because after the deal takes place, if the market thinks the seller was not worth as much as what the buyer paid, the buyer's share price is going to drop. On the other hand, if it thinks that the buyer got a really good deal and the seller's worth more, the buyer's share price is going to increase. So the share price could always change after the fact. And then finally, if you have synergies or other acquisition effects, that could also impact EBITDA and net income and the share prices and everything else here. So it's a very useful rule, but it doesn't always hold up. It is highly useful for interview questions, case studies, assessment center exercises, and anything else like that involving M&A deals.